Hi there and welcome to this second episode of What I Wish I Knew Before I Started Support Raising. In our first episode, we looked at the prevalence of those living on support seeming to live on very little or just enough, and we looked at some of the main reasons which might cause that. We also looked at the Bible and some of the things which the Bible has to say on support raising. So this time we're going to look at the power of partnership in support raising as opposed to just simply trying to raise funds. And also we're going to tackle that area of asking, which so many people seem to fear or to find uncomfortable or difficult. So what does partnership look like or what does it really mean? Mike, can we start with you? Yeah, at its simplest, it's building a team of those who partner in making your work a reality and making it effective. And it includes not just financial support, but it includes prayer and encouragement and many other things. So it really isn't just money and fundraising. It's actually all the other things that you need to sustain your mission or ministry. We often think that mission and ministry are both individual exercises, certainly when we start, but actually we, we can't do it alone. We do need other people. And so this is what the team is. These are what these partners are. They each provide a bit of a function for us so that the things that we can't do, they can help us with. Yes, I was thinking people don't go to war alone, they go as part of an army. So if someone thinks, well, I'm just going to go and fight on my own, they'll pretty quickly get picked off by the enemy. And this is kind of similar. If people go on their own thinking, I can do this alone, I don't need others, then they probably won't last very long. And also thinking of, of the army, there are so many different roles and they all need each other. They can't all just do the same role or it wouldn't work. Yeah, it makes me think of the Lord of the Rings. We've got Frodo, who's got this mission, really serious mission, quite a heavy burden to him. And he doesn't want to go on that journey alone. So he gathers some people around him, but it's not just anybody. These are carefully chosen people with particular skills and qualities just to help him carry that burden of, of his mission. And it's important to remember too that um, partnership is a two-way street. It's not just people investing in us and giving to us. But, you know, we want to partner with them, too. We want to pray for them. We want to be aware of what's happening in their lives. Um, so that's really key as well. When I started out on, uh, on uh, support raising for, for the mission that God called me to do, and I realised that I'd need other people, um, I kind of thought that, uh, you know, that was an extra thing that I wasn't quite prepared for. But after 30 years now, I realised that having a team of people having all these partners has just been such a blessing along the way, particularly in the hard times. So when you're kind of overseas and you're on your own and you're having a bad week, it's those times that the, the people that are part of your team that constantly encourage and affirm you, that constantly send their support, that constantly pray for you, that means the whole world to you when everything else seems to be uh, going wrong. So I, uh, I, appreciate it in the bad times or in the tough times but then in the good times you've got people to celebrate with as well and I just love the fact that there are folk that have walked our journey for all those years and that when we get together we've got a, a story to tell about the journey that we've been on together and, and I think that's very rich. Yeah and I mean when, when we started living on a support basis 45 years ago, to be truthful, for me, it was about the money. How do I get the money to do what I want to do? But within a year or so, I began to see this far more than this. And, I, and it's mostly because of the comments and input from the supporters themselves, thanking us for taking their support, being interested in us. And then I realized what Paul said about his supporters in Philippi was true. It is a partnership in the gospel. And like Joe said, it's, it's not just a one-way street in this. It's not just that they're partnering with us so we can fulfill what God's called us to do. We are partnering with them so that they can fulfill what God has called them to do also. Because it's not just the missionary who's the important person in this. Everyone is important. It's not a one-man show. Like Caroline said, going to war is not a one-man exercise. And it's a bit like uh, if, somebody, if, if a girl is getting married, she wants a bridesmaid. Why does she need a bridesmaid? Legally, anyone can, anyone can be the witness. They can just show up can be anybody at all but she needs somebody standing with her who is standing with her emotionally and many other ways and she's usually choosy about who she has as a bridesmaid 
And I would say over the years, we have come to that point. We're choosy at who we want on our, on our partner team because we don't want people to just give the money and forget about us. We want people who will give, who will pray, who will encourage. Uh, so it's a bit like putting together our wedding party. We, we, we want people who, who will do whatever it takes to see something fulfilled in our lives while at the same time fulfilling something in their lives. So think more bridesmaid or best man than, than, uh, than money. So that's an introduction to partnership and the idea of the power of partnership. And that really helps you to be clear on what it is you're asking people. Now let's dig into this area of asking, which fills so many people with dread. So Joe, why is it that so many people are afraid of asking or feel uncomfortable with it? Well, I think culturally, you know, we like to be independent. We like to rely on ourselves, particularly when it comes to money. And we don't like talking about money. I mean, I don't even like talking about money with my husband. So asking for money is just the worst. Mars gave the example of asking our bridesmaids. We're excited to ask bridesmaids. And I asked you guys if you'd be happy to join in this podcast and I didn't feel uncomfortable. But asking, like Joe, you said, talking about money is hard. Asking for money for ourselves, that I can understand is, is just a no-go. But I think that that's where partnership really helps because we're not actually asking for our own needs. The need, the ask isn't, would you pay my bills so that I can do this work? You're asking for them to, to join you to make this vision possible. And we call that the difference between a need-driven ask and a vision-driven ask. So Miles, could you touch on that? What's the difference between a need-driven ask and a vision-driven ask? Yeah, uh, excellent point and an important point because an, a need-driven ask is, I have a gap in my budget, please help me fill that. And that's coming along like a, that's a handout, that's almost a begging mentality. But that's not what we're doing. We're not asking people to partner with us because there's a gap in our budget. We're asking people to partner with us because there's a gap in the number of people in heaven. It's to do with the vision that God's put in our hearts to bring God's love and God's word and God's power into the lives of other people. So instead of going saying, please help me, I need money, it's coming with, with a hand like this extended in partnership. Please, will you join me together to help people experience the love of God in their lives? Not only is that an important difference, a very freeing difference. I'm not asking people, please help me go to the supermarket and buy food. I'm saying, will you walk the journey with me so that people will hear about Jesus? We commonly hear people say that they don't have anyone to ask, which means that we've already decided for those people that they wouldn't support us or couldn't support us for some reason. I had someone that, that I know say to me, I've asked everybody and there's no one else left to ask. And I said, well, you haven't asked me, so you haven't asked everybody. Um, and I did say, if you if want to invite me into your support team, I would be interested and they still didn't ask me. So Miles, what would you say to those people who say that they don't have anyone that they can ask? Yeah, when, when somebody says that, it's actually, it's, it's an emotional brain freeze. It's not actually based in reality. Everyone has a lot of people in their network of contacts, but somehow they block it all and they think, no, there's nobody left. There's nobody I can ask. So during the training, we go through a couple of exercises to help people identify the network of people God has given them. And we start not by saying, who will you ask, but who do you know? And that, that's actually a different issue. And once we get, this isn't saying you'll ask everybody, but who do you know? And going through those exercises helps people identify dozens and dozens of people that they already know. All of us, all of us know hundreds of people in some way or another. and it's just important to be able to draw that out. But yeah, we, so during the training, we do that exercise and sometimes people's eyes light up when they see the extent of the network that they have. So Miles, once you've got that list of people you, you know, how do you decide who you're going to invite in and in what order? Yeah, that's again, that's not a different question. Not who do you know, but who do you think is appropriate for you to sit down and talk to them about what God's called you to do? And again, we go through another exercise to help identify where each person is at in their ability to make an informed decision. 
it is true that some people don't even know that you're involved in mission work. Other people know and are able to make an make a decision. So it's it's how do you identify that, and then trying to to work out of all these people who do I want standing beside me. One of the questions I often ask is if God said you could only have one supporter standing with you, if you're only allowed one, who do you want? And in most cases, the person that will be chosen will be the person that's that's most emotionally connected to them, not necessarily the, the wealthiest. Uh, and then we just work from there. But it's identifying, first of all, who, who do I know? And then within that, who's appropriate for me to sit down and ask? But we have to remember, God often has a different plan. We saw last time that we, we looked at Elijah and the widow. The widow would not have been on Elijah's list until God brought it into his list. So we have to listen to God as well as look at our own lists. Okay, well, so just to push you a bit further, if mm -hmm. someone says, okay, I've, I've done everyone on my list, asked everyone who's appropriate, what do they do then? I suppose the best example for me, again, is back to Elijah in 1 Kings 19. We, we know the story. He went up to the cave to hide. He was depressed, and he had nobody left to stand with him. There was no supporters left. God said, what are you doing here? And he said, there's nobody to stand with me. And God's answer to Elijah was interesting. He didn't say, well, I'm going to create a new network for you. He said, go back the way you came on the road to Damascus. And he named three people. One of them was Elisha. And interestingly, on the way up to the cave, Elijah had walked past Elisha, predetermining that there was nobody left to ask. But he had walked past someone that God had chosen to be part of his team. So Again, I would often say to people, go back the way you came. Who is there that you've maybe started a conversation but haven't completed it? Who gets your prayer letter regularly but you've never asked? In most cases, most missionaries send a prayer letter to far more people than actually give to them. And, and sometimes there's no reason why they haven't asked people. Who's been giving at a smaller amount for years who could increase? Who gives irregularly could be prompted to give regularly? Who is supporting you who's got a very different network to you that you could perhaps ask them to introduce you to others? But going back the way you came is helpful. You don't have to reinvent people uh, to create new networks. God is not running around heaven thinking oh, they've run out of people. God already has them there, but we need to go back the way we've come, trace back the existing relationships to find where that will lead us to new ones. Another thing we tend to hear a lot is, I'm based in the UK or I work in a support role in a kind of back office role. So it's harder for me to raise support because people want to give to those in exciting countries or doing exciting roles. So again, there's an assumption there. Mike, how would you respond to that? Well, that's the exact situation I was in. I was working overseas, flying aircraft over Africa, and then uh, God called me back to the UK to, to run a website, effectively to set up and run a website working from an office. So again, going from one very si different situation to another, and I have to say, you've got to share the vision that God's given you. And that's why it comes back to the vision driven ask. It's not about needs. It is about what God's placed in your heart for you to do and who's going to continue on that journey with you. So practice sharing that vision with those people or a work on sharing that vision, put it together so that you can articulate it in the best way possible. Because what's going to happen then is those people who are going to continue on the journey with you, it's going to resonate with them and, and they will stay with you. And, and I'm, I'm happy to say when we did that, virtually all of our supporters stayed on board because they got our vision and they already had a relationship with us. Yeah, and... We looked last time also at the first structured support system, which was for the Levites in Numbers 18. And what sometimes overlooked in that, it was the Levites that got the support, not the priests. And the Levites were the back office people. They didn't actually do the sacrifices. They swept up after the sacrifices. They cleaned the dishes. They were not the, the top guys in, uh, in terms of, of, of the, the ministry there. It was the priests were the top guys. But God had enough wisdom and sense to make sure that the structured support went to the back office people because if they weren't there, the priests couldn't do their job. And intriguingly, in that context, it was the Levites supported the priests 
we're a long way off from getting back to that biblical model. But it was interesting that the first model was the resources came to the back office people. They then supported those that in today's terms would often be termed as frontline ministry. But I think all of ministry is frontline. And God recognized that from the outset. So my next question then is, how should we ask? What does asking actually look like? Well, we spend several hours going over this in the training, but the essence of it is that there are two steps to inviting someone to be a partner with you. The first is that you call them up and you arrange a time to meet with them. And then the second is that you actually meet with them, whether that's on Zoom or whether you're going to meet them over a meal or breakfast or a cup of coffee. Um, when you call them, it's important to be really clear what it is that you want to talk to them about. So although we've spent a lot of time saying that partnership is not all about finances, it's not. It's important that that's not, that part isn't a surprise to people when you meet up with them. So do mention that you want to talk about that in the phone call. And then when you meet up with them, you really want to cover um, the need that your work addresses, what you feel your particular role is in addressing that need. Um, also what their role is in a partner that you're going to be um, looking for um, prayer, you're going to be looking for encouragement and that you're also looking for financial support for the work that you're doing. Um, and then also thinking just about why you're asking them, what, what is special about them that makes you want them to be partnering with you in this work and then you have to actually ask them. Thanks Joe. you make it sound really easy, which is great. It may feel a little bit intimidating having these conversations. That's why we spend a lot of time in the training, giving you plenty of time to think through your vision, uh, how you want to share it, what you want to say, and to also practice asking people to get the practice getting the words finance out and to, to think of maybe phrases that will help you in that conversation. So it will really equip you to to enjoy invi inviting people in to your team and to join you in what God is doing. I really enjoy these, what we call coffee cup conversations. They're great conversations where you get to share what God is up to and you see people really respond and be really excited about joining in and about the opportunity they have. So we hope that you will join us on that training and that you will find the same thing and it will really lighten your load in ministry. So today we've looked at the concept of partnership and we've touched on the area of asking. In the next episode, we're going to look at areas around finance. For example, how much should I raise? And we'll leave you with the importance of training and coaching in your support raising journey. Sometimes the supporters think, you are spending my money. No, I'm not. I'm spending God's money. Sometimes we feel like planning and saving for the future is not compatible with trusting God to provide for us. I, I, I heard from somebody just this week who's 79 and she's still working because she hadn't really planned adequately for retirement.